I waited for Grand Theft Auto V with great anticipation, and of course bought it on launch day in September 2013. It was fantastic and lived up to all my expectations at the time, but in the years since then it's failed to leave as strong of an impact as Rockstar's other games. For around 8 years, part of me has felt that Grand Theft Auto V is overrated. With each passing year, I'm sure this feeling only increased as I got further and further from actually having played the game, especially around the 5 year mark upon the release of a little indie game called Red Dead Redemption 2 which to me felt like Rockstar's magnum opus and therefore likely pushed GTA V deeper into obscurity for me. I always remember the game as having an incredibly crafted but eventually formulaic open world, a certainly passable but ultimately forgettable story, enjoyable but not revolutionary or particularly unique gameplay, and good but not entirely memorable or relatable characters, especially considering its three protagonist setup. So with the recent re-re-re-release of the game on current generation consoles, and with a noticeably low price tag to pique my interest, I decided to put my memory to the test and find out if the second best selling and fifth highest reviewed game of all time is as mediocre as I recall. And as you can probably already tell from the title, well, you know how it is. I want to talk about why I was wrong about Grand Theft Auto V. Being a Grand Theft Auto game, it was obvious that GTA V was going to have an incredible open world, I mean, this is Rockstar Games we're talking about, it's what they do. And of course, it did. I always loved that the world had some variety, with the city to the south and desert to the north, and some greenery and water in between and all around. But I suppose, in the eight years since last playing the game properly, a lot of this specific information about the world had slipped my mind. In this time, the closest I got to playing the game again was through watching videos of people playing GTA Online, and at that point, not only is the city essentially acting as a backdrop to the events happening in the video, but a lot of these videos tend to take place in similar areas, namely the airport or custom maps where the original world is basically non-existent. Whenever I would think about GTA V's Los Santos, I'd remember it as good, but it would pale in comparison to GTA San Andreas's version of the city, or the vibrant setting of Vice City, or even the dreary nature of GTA 3 or 4's Liberty City. It was nice, and Rockstar did a good job of recreating Los Angeles, but I'd much rather spend time in these other worlds. And I guess in a way that remains partly true. The PS2 games and even GTA 4 are so nostalgic to me, and even if they weren't so highly regarded by most, I'd probably still love them simply due to my history with them. But besides that, I couldn't have been more wrong about GTA 5's Los Santos. Watching videos of other people playing in this world, in the multiplayer version of it no less, is far less gratifying than actually exploring it yourself. Honestly, the driving controls probably play some role in this, but the world is so enjoyable to just exist in and explore. When I mentioned that the map had variety, I was right, but it's not just simply city, desert, greenery, and water. There's the South Central neighborhoods, predominantly populated by African American gangs, the Eastern District, largely Latino, Little Seoul, largely Korean, Vespucci and Del Perro, full of tourists, Morningwood, full of middle upper class and their stores, Vinewood, full of rich people's businesses, Vinewood Hills full of rich people's homes, Rockford Hills where the rich people shop, and that's just Los Santos alone. Blaine County is even larger and also quite diverse, with desert, forest and mountains, and the similar but distinctive towns of Grape Seed, Sandy Shores and Polito Bay. Even after playing through the game myself, and years of watching others play it, I'm still discovering things that I'd never seen before, or at least things that I'd forgotten ever existed. Like the large hardware store in Grand Sonora Desert, which does nothing but is interesting to see or the art installation in Sandy Shores, which I vaguely remember but had never really explored, or the ultra camp near Mount Chiliad, which I partly wish I'd never discovered. Have you found a penis? It's such a cliche thing to say, but the world just feels so alive. There are so many other vehicles on the road, and the wilderness is filled with beautiful animals, something I've largely forgotten about, probably because it's new to the series, but is especially evident and appreciated on PlayStation 5. Each location in the game is filled with people who not only look appropriate, or inappropriate, but sound, speak, and act appropriate too. Obviously there's not quite as much detail or intricate behaviour as Red Dead Redemption 2, but I'd say that's not only understandable, but preferable. Grand Theft Auto has never really tried to be a super realistic or poignant experience. It certainly takes itself seriously enough at times, and has some genuinely emotional and important moments which I love, but it's always been about these larger than life characters and these dramatic, mostly illegal events so detail on the level of Red Dead Redemption 2 would just feel extreme. That doesn't mean that these larger-than-life characters or the dramatic moments can't be appreciated as much as those in Red Dead though, which brings me to the story. 
Maybe it's because it was preceded by games like GTA 4 and Red Dead Redemption, and followed by Red Dead Redemption 2. Or maybe it's because it was released in the same year as The Last of Us. But I've always remembered GTA 5's story as, well, forgettable, which I guess is kind of the recurring element here of my past experiences. I certainly remembered moments from the story. The prologue is basically unforgettable, the bank robberies are especially memorable, the bury the hatchet mission always struck me as notably but subtly heartbreaking, and the player choice in the finale has always been a go-to for discussions, but more specific story threads and individual missions never stuck in my head like those of San Andreas or GTA 4. In retrospect, and now having played the game again, I think I can partly understand why that was the case. In San Andreas and GTA 4, and basically every other GTA game if not Rockstar game, it's rare to get a bad mission, but most missions are good, with several in particular that stand above the rest. I honestly don't mind that several of the missions end up being pretty similar. Drive here, shoot these people, drive back. But it would be an understandable complaint to have, and I think that's why ultimately there are moments in those games that feel especially memorable, since the rest of them largely blend together. It's a good blend, but a blend nonetheless. In GTA 5 though, I feel like a lot of these missions don't blend together. Not counting the high setup missions, but counting the different heist approaches and the three finales separately, there are about 60 required story missions in the game. Of these 60, 59 require driving, or at least they expect driving, I guess you could run in some of these if you really wanted. And the only one that doesn't isn't really a mission at all, it's basically just an interactive cutscene. And sure, that is a lot of driving, but then again that's implied by the name of the game, so I don't think it's that egregious. And besides, it's the stuff that happens before and after the driving that I think is particularly important. Around 37 of the 60 missions require some type of standard shooting or killing. That's a decent amount, but it's still only a little more than half. The next highest is sniping, flying, escaping, and chasing, all with around 10 to 13 missions each, about 15 to 20% of the total missions. But what really struck me is how many of these missions have activities that you'll only do a handful of times. You're required or suggested to perform stealthily about five times. You repel three times. You can take Chop's perspective twice. And there are so many activities that you're only required to do once, or not at all depending on your heist approach. Use a crane, mop the floor, tattoo genitalia on a man's chest or back. I'm not saying all of these are perfect. I'm aware that some people have complaints about the pacing of some of them, and that's fair enough. But I personally feel like Rockstar deserves credit for at least trying to keep things fresh. There are so many new and unique gameplay features here, or new to the series at least, and it rarely feels like you're just following a simple formula. In Rockstar fashion, they're all well designed too. Mopping a floor might sound boring, but mopping a floor to gain access to a high security government building in order to plant bombs is far less boring, and the animation alone makes it interesting to look at at least. And then you've got missions like minor turbulence where you need to fly a plane inside another plane, kill everyone on board, and then jump out mid-flight. I don't think I need to explain why I like that one. To me, it feels like GTA 5 cut some of the fat that might have dragged some of its predecessors down. I love GTA 4 an unhealthy amount, but that game has a lot of fat in the middle. There are a lot of missions that almost feel like they exist to fulfill a quota, complete a certain number of missions so that this person will either do you a favour, or introduce you to someone else for whom you can complete a certain number of missions. It makes the game feel longer. Despite actually apparently being shorter than GTA 5, it has more story missions overall. And in all honesty, I love that about GTA 4. It makes it feel like a long, epic gangster movie filled with dozens of characters and plot threads that ultimately keep you engaged enough to see you through to the end. But GTA 5 isn't meant to be a long, epic gangster movie. It's more like an action or heist film, still with plenty of engaging characters and plot threads, but with a significant focus on the heist themselves. This played a significant role in the marketing of the game, and rightfully so. They're easily some of the most enjoyable missions in the entire series, Outside of the heist 2 though, the missions are still incredibly entertaining and important, often used as a way to set up the heists, or as a direct result of them. There are about a dozen mission givers in the game. Take out the protagonists and the heists themselves, you're left with 8, all of whom contribute significantly to the story overall. For example, Simeon Yutarian gives Franklin the missions that eventually lead him to Michael. Tao Cheng gives Trevor missions to reveal more of his backstory and business. Solomon Richards provides character development for Michael and indirectly reunites him with his family. Martin Madrazo sets up the reasons for doing heists in the first place, and for Michael and Trevor's exile to the north. And throughout the whole story you're consistently completing missions for the FIB, Lester, and Devon Weston, all of whom are critical to the main story threads, and all of whom are essentially the mission givers for each of the three finale missions. Regarding the characters themselves, 
Well, GTA 5 had the difficult task of trying to make you care not only for the protagonist, but three protagonists. And honestly, I feel like they do a really great job with this. I care about Franklin enough to want him to get out of the gang life and set himself up for success, but without forgetting where he came from. I care about Michael enough to want him to change his attitude and fix his broken family. And I care about Trevor enough to want him to overcome his temper and solve his problems so that he can live a happier life. All three characters have negative traits that almost make them unlikable, but they're balanced by traits that do the opposite, making me empathize with their situations. Interestingly enough, I found myself acting differently depending on who I was controlling. In most games, when presented with a choice, I'll always choose the positive one, probably because I play so much Red Dead Redemption 2 and I'm just worried about losing honor. When I come across a random event in GTA 5 though, it could go either way. As Franklin, when I see someone robbed, I'll retrieve the stolen item and return it, since it feels like Franklin would do the same. As Trevor, however, I'll retrieve the stolen item and simply run away with it, or return it and then immediately kill the person to steal it back, since that's almost certainly what Trevor would do. In fact, the dialogue basically confirms that returning it is out of character for Trevor. I find myself suffering from a momentary attack of goodwill. I never had this encounter as Michael, but both of these options would seem appropriate depending on his mood, though most likely he'd just ignore it. Each of the protagonists have their own small group of supporting characters who play fairly important roles in the story too. Franklin has Lamar, Trevor has Ron, Wade and Floyd, and Michael has his wife Amanda and children Tracy and Jimmy. Each of these characters feels so distinct from one another, yet they're all pretty basic and stereotypical in their personalities. Ron is the paranoid conspiracy theorist, Floyd is the nervous, by-the-book man frightened of his fiance. Jimmy is the whiny son addicted to video games and marijuana. Tracy is the typical valley girl, and so on. Are these stereotypes necessarily bad? Well, on the surface, stereotypes like this can be damaging overall, but the whole point of them is to be satirical, and a lot of these characters go deeper than surface level when you think about it. For example, Lamar is an incredibly loyal and loving man. Jimmy eventually takes accountability for his actions and begins to make changes in his life. And Tracy is actually quite sweet, and clearly cares for her father. On some level, I feel like making these characters rather stereotypical is not only unsurprising, but perhaps even wise, since making them too interesting and multi-layered might end up putting more attention on them and take focus away from the development of the protagonists. The same could be said about the antagonists too. The wealthy investor, the government agent slash reality show host, the triad leader, and the defected gang member. They're basic and still largely forgettable I think, but that's okay. The story is about the protagonists, their supporting characters, and the heists. The antagonists are mostly there to be annoying, get in the way, and then be killed at the end. Personally, I'd much rather Frank Tenpenny or Dmitry Raskolov, but I can still appreciate what GTA 5 set out to achieve. But then again, what did GTA 5 set out to achieve? The game's writer, Dan Hauser, once said that they were trying to push video games forward to the best of their limited ability. I guess the same could be said about any game developer. If a game can leave its mark, push the industry forward, and inspire other experiences, then that's probably way more than they could ever even consider hoping for. Rockstar has certainly had its fair share of doing all of the above. And with GTA 5, I guess the same is partly true. It most certainly left its mark on the industry, and it only takes one look at the sales figures to see how. Did it inspire other experiences? As far as I can tell, perhaps not directly, at least not as far as any developer has admitted, but you don't get that successful without turning a few heads and I'm sure it's influenced creatives in some ways. As for pushing the industry forward, besides maybe GTA Online pushing developers to reconsider their focus on multiplayer, I'm not sure GTA 5 has made as big of an impact as one might expect from a game that has outsold entire franchises. It's clearly very well known, it's sold very well, and it's liked well enough, but doesn't feel as impactful as previous entries in the series. Even Red Dead Redemption 2 felt like it was having an industry-wide impact in the weeks and months after its release. Perhaps then this is partly the reason I forgot so much of what I loved about this game. I've played so many games since last playing GTA 5, and I've grown a lot in that time. So it would take a truly industry-shaking, innovative experience to stick with me for that long, I suppose. And the part of GTA 5 that I found particularly innovative and industry-shaking was its marketing, waiting for each new trailer, watching them over and over again, and dissecting each element frame by frame was so important to me, and has truly stuck with me over the years. So it's no wonder that I remember that experience more than playing the game itself. So then, did GTA 5 achieve what it set out to? Well, innovation isn't everything, and even Rockstar knows that. More importantly than that, at least to the developer, was that it was fun. I can very, very confidently say, yes, GTA 5 is fun.
In fact, it's one of the most fun gaming experiences I've had in some time. Existing in that beautiful world, so cleverly crafted and utilized, with graphics that, even on Xbox 360, still rival some of the games that we see today. The story, with its unique and capable use of three playable protagonists, its fast and intense pacing, and its cleverly structured and considered missions. And the gameplay, so incredibly polished with so many unique elements, very rarely if ever feeling repetitive or unremarkable. Of course, it's okay if your experience is the complete opposite. But to me it seems, Rockstar made such a consistently good game that I appear to have forgotten anything especially positive or negative to say about it, and thus it became... forgettable. But if there's anything that my recent playthrough has told me, it's that it is anything but forgettable. It is a very good game. And to that end, I'm actually happy to say that I was wrong about Grand Theft Auto V.